Welcome to Off The Record. I'm your host, Marika, and I'm a dietitian, nutritionist, and recovering perfectionist. Join me each week as I bring you raw and real conversations with inspiring men and women discussing matters in health and nutrition that are often swept under the rug. Sit back, relax, pour yourself a cup of coffee or a wine, and enjoy learning from conversations that help us to understand the messiness of what it means to be a healthy and balanced human. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Off The Record. Today is episode number three, and I am interviewing the gorgeous Kira Rumble. Now, I started following Kira on Instagram. It would have been a couple of years ago, and I just found her story so inspiring and so, I guess, real and relatable and you know, what she was sharing on social media around um, the struggles that she was going through, I thought was something that we all really needed to hear a lot more of. Um, You know, obviously on social media, we do see a lot of the positives. um, And I think that Kira shows a really good uh, reflection of what real life is like. So um, today's with Kira. She is the founder and CEO of Crumbled Foods. And in her early 20s, Kira was diagnosed as pre-diabetic. Uh, and was forced to quickly change the way that she was living and eating. More recently, though, Kira has struggled with endometriosis and infertility. And Kira, at the time of recording this podcast, was pregnant with her beautiful baby boy, who potentially is going to be entering the world at about the time of releasing of this podcast. So I can't say whether there is a boy in the world yet, but he is on the way. Um, In today's episode, though, I chat with Kira about her struggles with miscarriage and the impact that it had on her mental health, uh, as well as what sort of tools and strategies she used to help her get through this really challenging, challenging period in her life. Now, trigger warning for this episode, we are speaking openly about pregnancy loss, miscarriage and sexual assault. Um, Hope you enjoyed the episode and let's dive on in. Welcome, Kira Rumble. What a cool name, by the way. I am so excited to have you on the podcast today. I feel like this has been a long time coming and I feel like I have known you for such a short period of time, but I feel like I have got to know you so well in such a short period of time because of how amazing you are online. Um, So thank you for being here today and being our very first guest on the podcast. That's okay. Thanks for having me. I feel like we've already met in person, but we actually haven't because of COVID. I know. It's crazy. I feel like, yeah, I know you and I've seen you so many times on both social media and on our meetings that we've had online and everything. So um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, having this chat with you. Um, I actually wanted to cover some different topics that um, potentially that you haven't been speaking about as much lately. So I know that firstly, congratulations on your pregnancy. Um, When we first connected, you weren't pregnant, I don't think. Um, but I had a sneaking suspicion in the coming, I don't know why, I just had this feeling that in the coming months that you were going to fall pregnant and you went a little bit quiet online for a while and I was um, sitting there thinking and I was like, I bet you she's pregnant and then you announced it soon after. <laughs> I know, I couldn't keep it a secret for too long because we did IVF so I sort of, I really wanted to shout from, you know, the mountains that we were finally pregnant properly because obviously, uh, well, not obviously because some people listening might not know, but we had uh, six losses before we went into IVF. So it was just, yeah, full on time. But everyone's like, why are your boobs bigger on Instagram yeah. and why aren't you on your stories as much? And I'm like, well, okay. So we ended up telling everyone at nine weeks, which is, I think, you know, everyone should celebrate any pregnancy at any time. Absolutely. And that was actually one of the things I wanted to speak to you about is um, speaking about it early because it's something that I think that we're taught that you don't speak about early. Um, But I actually, when you announced it early, I thought that was such a brave move on your part and such a good move as well, because what, and what this whole podcast is about is about, you know, sharing stories that people do feel alone in, in their health journeys. And for me, I was thinking, well, you know, if you've been through so many losses, you don't want to be alone on that journey. You want people to be there for you. And I think traditionally, like even family are not, you know, told before 12 weeks, which is just crazy. Like to think that if you, like it's still a loss before 12 weeks. Losses aside, you're still feeling rotten. Yes, so I, I was one of those wonderful people that I, I think I was so fixated on falling pregnant and keeping bub that 
I didn't really think about what it would look like if I was really sick. And for yeah. me, I'm I'm 21 and a half weeks as date of recording or whatever. And um, I was vomiting 10 to 20 times a day up until 17 weeks. So I was not graced with that blissful first trimester. But I think that it's just, you know, obviously do whatever's comfortable for you. But for me, it's harder to mourn a loss of a loved one when you don't know about the, you know, the miracle of pregnancy. Pregnancy is such a miracle. And I don't know, for me, it was always a personal preference to talk about it earlier because you might have a loss or, you know, you might be feeling rubbish and it's important to tell and have these conversations earlier, in my opinion. So for me, I, I totally respect people that keep up until the 12 weeks. But for me, I think that it should be celebrated no matter how far along you are. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you're right. Like it's sharing it with whoever, you know, you want to is, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be online or publicly or anything for other people, but like sharing it, your journey. And, you know, if you are feeling rotten and everything, I, I don't think, and I'm just trying to think now, I don't think there's been a situation where I've shared a struggle that I'm going through and not felt better for sharing that. Maybe not online publicly, you know, sometimes, you know, you do have to wait until you're at the right place for, to share that. But particularly with your close friends and family and those sorts of things, I think that, you know, if it's something that you're struggling with, whether it be because of previous losses, whether it be because of um, being unwell and fatigued and drained and everything, um, or just celebrating as well, like yeah. that's a, a very valid reason to share. So I think that, um, yeah, that was very brave of you. So well done on um, sort of breaking that stigma down there. Thanks. <laughs> Um, well, I actually wanted to start the podcast with a little bit about your um, history in terms of competitive skiing. This is something that I did not know um, <laughs> much about from, <laughs> I think I only started following you online about, oh, it would have been six or 12 months ago, maybe, maybe 12 months ago. Um, I did not know you were a competitive skier. Could you tell us more about that and how you got into it and what that was like for you? Yeah, sure. So I, it seems like a lifetime ago, I, when I was 13, started skiing for a race club and I started doing all of these competitions. I started spending week, winters down at the snow. I did a bit of homeschooling. It was just something that my dad was really passionate about skiing. Mm. Um, and that came from my grandfather. My grandfather was one of the, you know, founding people for the um, ski patrol, the ski patrol at Threadbo. So for me, it's been sort of ingrained in my family. And so when I started skiing, I picked it up really easily. And so my dad was really happy. <laughs> my, dad, my dad really. Did you enjoy it? Did I enjoy it? Yeah. I did. But the race element and the competitiveness, I think, ruined it for me a little bit. Mm. and for me I think I was 13 and all of my friends were going out and you know mingling and meeting friends and you know going to parties and I was down at the snow training yeah I mean I remember doing the beat test in ski boots in the snow oh and I was it was very regimented it was very early you know it it really taught me a lot on how I actually thrive on routine and structure yeah. and for me I operate at my peak when I've got a set routine and set structure yeah and so I did I, I learned a lot I ended up going to Japan and the US and skiing with ski teams over there I then um, had a really bit bad accident when I was 15 and I shattered my shin and broke both my arms mm. and so I was kind of forced into early retirement yeah um but you know what? I think that my my love for skiing really stopped very quickly when I started, you know, doing this professional skiing. And I think my body almost saw that I wasn't enjoying it. And I had a lot yeah. of other issues going on at, the, at that time. I had a bit of trauma um, going on in my my early teens. And I think my body just literally just said enough is enough. Yeah. It's so fascinating when your body literally stops you from doing the things that you think that you are meant to be doing or you think that you're enjoying and your body sort of just intervenes and goes, no, nah, it's not happening. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I mean, I was over in Japan and 
I had fractured my wrist. This was before I broke both my arms. I had fractured my wrist. And I remember having to go to a Japanese hospital. And this was before Japan, the Seiko, uh, became very, you know, popular. So we were one of the only Aussies in the village. And I had to try and explain to them that I had broken my wrist but they're like, take off your shoes, take off your shoes. And obviously that's their culture. And so I was at the front of the hospital trying to take off my boots, my ski boots with a broken wrist. And I just thought, and I just thought to myself, this is really a crap thing to be going through when I was 13. So I think that it obviously served its time and purpose in my life. And I look back at it, but um, I think that it all happened for a reason. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, do you did you find that transition out of going from like being a professional athlete into sort of everyday normalcy a challenging one? It's sort of something that I've heard a lot of people speak about in the, the transition from both a way of in terms of how your body composition changes, how you eat, how you exercise. Did you see any changes, you know, in both your lifestyle and your body? Um, and how did you manage that? Yeah, so I guess that that was the defining moment that led me to eventually be diagnosed with insulin resistance um, years later. So I would be eating, I'd be, you know, on a typical day for me eating on a, on a ski slope would be killer pythons, blue Powerade, um, you know, keeping that sugar high and, you know, having chocolates in my um, ski jacket and it was very much fueling me. And I didn't have any idea. And, you know, it wasn't really at that time that coaches were talking about what you're eating. And sometimes when you're burning that much, you do need to have like, you know, kilopythons and power to get enough sugar into if you're burning that much as well. Yeah. And I don't know if you've seen a skier's body, Mm. but very solid. I mean, I was a solid girl back then and I was even told that I was too light. Um, You know, so I had to, you know, we had a lot of training about building glutes and quads and, you know, my quads still are so strong. And I've barely done any exercise for five months because I'm obviously just been so sick. So I found that I really struggled with the mental transition from being super active to obviously I was essentially bedridden for a little bit. And then I had to really sort of assimilate back into my friendship groups and I changed schools and I was really struggling with a lot of trauma from a sexual assault and Mm -hmm. I really didn't understand what the hell was going on and I really just went into this fight or flight mode I was addicted to sugar Mm. I used to constantly get headaches I remember during my HSC I would be down with migraines feeling constantly nauseous my knuckles were swollen I would be eating all of these sugary foods and carbs just because I didn't know better. And I loved cooking. I was a good cook. I've always been a good cook. You know, my family have always loved food. Yeah. But um, I think the whole process really hit me when I went into, I think I was about 19, 20, and I put on quite a lot of weight. And I realised, I remember I was sitting at the beach and I was like there's something that I just I feel like I'm missing out on life there's something not right I shouldn't be feeling this sick I shouldn't be having lack of energy I should be you know I see these mums with newborns running along the beach after them they've got you know what I thought was energy but probably now (laughs) it's sleep (laughs) deprivation um you know I, I just knew that there was just something not quite right and to feel you know, lethargic, to have nausea, to have swollen knuckles and to constantly be eating sugar to get through the day. I mean, Mm -hmm. I would be stopping off at the servo to get lollies and Red Bulls and Vs just to help me get through the day. I can so resonate with that with my pre-celiac. I know that you Mm. (laughs) are probably going to get to that point, but yeah, pre-celiac diagnosis, that was me, Red Bulls to get me through. 100%. And I just couldn't understand. And my partner at the time, he was like, I just don't understand why you're so tired. And I'm like, well, (laughs) I don't know either. And so I went to a few doctors and they did all of my panels and 
I just didn't get answers. And I remember I'd been going to the doctors since I was about 17, just complaining about headaches. I went to a neurologist. My mum took me to a neurologist because I had migraines. Mm. Um, you know, I was about to have an endoscopy to find out why I was so nauseous and all of these reasons, um, all of these doctors just saying that there's, they've got no idea. And so I then went to a functional integrative doctor down in Manly and he tested my insulin and my insulin was sky high and he just looks at me and he's like, you're, I think I was 21 at the time or 20. And he's like, if you don't make a change, you're going to be diabetic. That must have been such a confronting thing to hear coming from being like a fit professional athlete to being told that, you know, that you're on your way to diabetes. Yeah. And I'm very much... A person that if I'm told something's wrong I go and research and I go and make a change overnight so literally overnight I went and bought all well I asked him I was like so what can I do and he's like look up low GI diets and see if that resonates with you and so for me I decided to become a vegetarian who the hell knows why <laughs> I'm not a vegetarian so anymore. Not vegetarian yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not a vegetarian anymore. Um, I decided to go vego and completely change what I was eating. And so I remember I bought all of these low GI cookbooks, and I just completely changed how I was cooking. And I started to document it because I thought that I had a lot of friends and family that were sort of in the same boat, you know, really struggling with their weight, weren't feeling healthy, weren't feeling good, yeah. and what I was creating was really tasty food. So that's sort of how I was snowballed into the the Instagram and the social media and the WordPress world. Mm. And I started um, documenting it and I started sharing all of my recipes with my friends. And this and, is where um, Crumbled began, I'm assuming? Yeah, it Crumbled. So, uh, yeah, Crumbled really was just an online recipe website that I literally just shared all of my recipes. I studied nutrition and so I just really thought that people could value what I was doing mm. and um, I didn't think it would go anywhere and then all of a sudden my friend's like, I've been sharing this with all my friends and they want you to put it up on a website and I had no idea about SEO or anything like that. And then after that, I um, I just kept on doing it and my photographer, I went and bought a camera and really started documenting it all. But um. I guess where I'm going from this is it just really flowed into that natural progression about, you know, it wasn't normal to feel that way yes. and it wasn't normal to carry, you know, a high BMI. And I'm all about, you know, being the healthiest version of yourself. Mm. But for me, I was not healthy and my body was literally screaming out by the additional weight that I was carrying. And so I really focused on moving my body, eating healthily, swapping out things so I used to love lasagna so I would try and make healthier versions of lasagna and you know I used to love sweets yeah. and one of the biggest things for me was I was time poor I was working you know eight till eight in an office job and I didn't have energy and so I would be going to the supermarket looking for healthier options and then it wasn't until I started studying that I realized that a lot of these healthier so-called health food products were actually loaded full of hidden sugars and the sugar content was the same as, you know, the equivalent of two cinnamon donuts and some of yeah. these protein balls. Or sugar alcohols that just make you feel so bloated and gassy. Correct. Yeah, or just didn't taste nice. So that was sort of really what snowballed me into my food business, snowballed me into my social media platform. Mm. And, yeah. It's an incredible journey. Um, can I ask a question with your um, or your health journey, what role do you think? So this is something that I've sort of worked with a lot of clients on in the past. But what role do you think your trauma had in the physical manifestations of um, you know many of your symptoms around pain and weight gain and those sorts of things? Do you think it played any role, um, or would you think there was any coping mechanisms around your trauma that contributed to those or helped uh, along the way? Like, is there anything there that you think from? You know, whether it's, you know, recovery through the trauma process or um, as a result of the trauma and sort of not processing the trauma? So for me, I haven't really spoken too much about my trauma, um, but for me, I literally blocked it out for years. Yeah. I thought I dealt with it when I was about 17, 16, mm -hmm. and I definitely didn't. And I started getting PTSD symptoms probably about 
seven, six or seven years ago. And then that's when I started going to therapy and actually regaining all of these, you know, memories and really realizing that I had actually gone through a significant, significant trauma. And what I did have was PTSD and depression. But what I do know now is my coping mechanism was sugar. And sugar, as you definitely know, is the number one culprit for leading to, you know, anxiety and spikes in your insulin and just a whole array of mental health issues that really can you know bring everything to the surface and then you crash and burn so I really think that my coping mechanism at the time Mm. was eating and sugar and I mean that's a lot of people and I don't think my approach that is I don't think that it's the worst coping mechanism because however you cope is a fine way to cope like you know processing trauma is such a challenging thing and for a lot of people like you said you don't even know whether you're processing it or not like you don't know how far along that journey you are you don't know when things are going to come back up again you don't know you know what's going to happen essentially in terms of that journey of processing trauma and so I always say that like my clients when I was working with them is that you know coping by you know binging on food or anything like that that's not the worst way to cope like you know if there are so many worse ways that you can, you know, process trauma than binging on sugar or anything like that. So I think it's really yeah. important to acknowledge that, yeah, like that, that is not a healthy way to do it, but it's also not the worst way. And whatever you need to do to survive, to get through and to get you to the point where, you know, you are going to therapy and those sorts of things to do the healthy coping mechanisms, um, I think is a totally valid coping mechanism. Like we said, it's, it's not the healthiest and it's not going to be, um, helping you deal with the trauma or, you know, like I said, with the sugar and everything and the effect it has on your mental well-being and everything, it's not actually going to be yet yeah, processing that in a way that is helpful. But if it's keeping you alive, then that's the most important thing. 100%. And I think that I'm a big believer in that we've been given our journey for a purpose. Mm. And for me, you know, through my endometriosis, my fertility journey, my insulin resistance and you know all of my PTSD I really think that I've been given this journey for a reason and I've got to learn my lessons from it so you know without me being addicted to sugar I never would have created my food business and you know without me having certain traumas I never would have met certain people and I think that everything happens for a reason and you just really got to trust the process. But obviously once you start identifying that, you know, hey, this is actually a coping mechanism, maybe I need to go speak to somebody, that is that crucial moment where you can actually go and get help and then start your recovery. Yeah, so on that, when did you reach out for help and what did that sort of look like for you? Because I know that people who are in a similar boat to you might be wondering the same thing that, you know, that they're sitting there with this and thinking, well, that's that's a really challenging thing to do to actually reach out for help and also speaking about these matters is something that people really really struggle with one because like you said potentially a lack of memory around them um but which is mind you a coping mechanism as well um uh, it's it's not through the, you actually not remembering your your body is holding that somewhere um but speaking up about these matters is really really challenging so what is it that you know where did you begin on that journey about speaking up on it So I think when I started noticing I had some really bad self-sabotaging PTSD, so PTSD is sort of a whole heap of um, symptoms related to your trauma. So I had, you know, a lot of self-sabotage, you know, a few years ago and I really sort of, it had to be something that my partner ended up pulling me up on and he's Mm -hmm. like, I think you need to go get help. Um you just don't seem like your normal happy self. And Mm -hmm. at that moment, I was just sort of like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. But I was like, maybe I do need to speak to somebody. And I went to the GP and I got put on a Medicare health um, plan, healthcare plan. And um, it took me a long time to find the right therapist. It's hard. It is really hard. I went to a psychiatrist who just put me on antidepressants. Did you find them helpful? Yeah, I'm still on antidepressants. I'm still on Zoloft. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. I think that there's such a bad stigma with antidepressants. Well, and I was actually going to say to you, what, what, how did you feel when you were told that you were going on antidepressants? Because I know that there is such a, a bad stigma around it, and it's something that I, I love speaking up about because I think it's 
something that if it is something that's keeping you alive or giving you your mental well-being, it is so important to be included so as important. part of your mental health plan. Um, yep. It should not be your only like strategy when it comes to your mental health plan. Like I think it's really important that you know people are going to therapy and exercising and these yep. sorts of things. But medication for a lot of people actually is a part of that. So yeah, how did you feel when the doctor told you? I was mortified. I was so embarrassed. I remember going to the chemist and being so embarrassed about you know asking for an antidepressant. And now I'm like, can I get some Zoloft? Can I get my Zoloft repeat? You know, so it's very much a change of con- I think that people are starting to speak about it more too Absolutely. but um I saw that as you're broken we need to fix you with medicine mm. and you know finding a psychiatrist that's you know one of their things that they mainly do is to medicate um so I then went to a psychologist and probably the past three years has been the most crucial time in my actual recovery because I finally found somebody who takes a holistic approach so you know, she's very well accredited. She's a genius, you know, um, in what she does, but she actually explains what's going on with my brain and, um, the way that she sort of, you know, breaks it down being like, you know, you've got your left and your right sides of your brain. And then you've got the, in the middle, which is like, imagine the Harbour Bridge and imagine, you know, it being bumper to bumper because there's been an accident and it's getting traffic logged. And, um, you know, that's what's happening with my brain and I can't actually process my trauma. So she's just really, um, great in that respect and, you know, encourages mindfulness and encourages breathing. And um, I've started doing Vedic meditation. Oh, lovely. Are you enjoying it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I've been doing it for nearly a year now. Um, but, yeah, I just think that it's finding that right person to fit for you. Mm-hmm. So if you go and sit down with somebody and you don't vibe with them, maybe give them one or two to those. But if you don't feel connected, it's time to move on. And I definitely respect that getting into a psychologist, especially on a a healthcare plan, it's, it's quite challenging. And a lot of uh, psychologists don't open their books and um, it is expensive, but I really see the value in, you know, talking to somebody that's not actually a family or friend that can actually give you the proper advice. So that was sort of my, my journey on my mental health that I, you know, some things have happened recently that have really triggered me again. And I am seeing my psychologist every week. Mm, It's amazing of you. It's just something that I need to do. I mean, I was meant to see her today, but she was sick, but um, it's just something that really helps me. And I feel so much better for Mm. it. And I mean, I've got three businesses. Um, I'm extremely busy and a lot of my clients would have no idea that you know I have got PTSD and I'm you know clinically diagnosed with depression and anxiety so I think that it's you know you can have somebody that looks like they've got their shit together and they really don't and I think that that's really the importance of why I speak about this stuff on my Instagram because even when I was going through my miscarriages I'd be looking around and I'd be like no one's speaking about this and I you know is this normal? You know, why am I going through this? And then when I started speaking about it, it was the most upsettingly beautiful thing to go through because I had so many other women reach out to me and, and say, I'm going through the same thing. Yeah. It's because it's like you feel you belong, but then you belong for a reason that you sort of almost don't want to belong for because it's not a fun thing to belong to. But knowing that you belong is just, it's just so reassuring. And I think, I I feel like that I'm in a similar boat to you in that sense that what I really struggle with with my mental health is that there was nobody that I, like my understanding of mental health growing up was that, and I was literally in this conversation yesterday with someone, and my picture of mental health growing up or mental illness growing up was like, you know, you're in bed crying, you can't get out of bed, you're in the corner shaking, and that was not my experience of mental illness. And, you know, like you said, like running a business and everything like that, like, you know, I show up, I work with my clients, I do everything. and I can get it all done and get it all done quite well. But that doesn't mean that I'm not mentally unwell and that doesn't mean that I don't need help or anything. And I think for me it was that there was no picture of somebody who was struggling yet looked like what I looked like essentially. Like there was no image for me to look up to and be like, oh, wow, like she's going through the same thing as me. It was like the only picture of mental illness that I'd sort of been made aware of, I think, and I don't even know how I would have been made aware of it, but the only picture I had is, 
that you're sort of bedridden and you need to go to hospital or, you know, these sorts of things. It wasn't like high functioning. And that, yeah. as soon as I realized that that was a thing, it was like, oh, like, okay, this is a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that, I think society in, in general are doing a lot in terms of having this dialogue about um, mental health and mental illness and depression and anxiety. But I think that sometimes you can get people that aren't qualified Mm -hmm. to be speaking, giving poor advice. And I think that that's where it becomes damaging. I mean, it's all well and good to talk about, you know, my my struggles and your struggles, you know, obviously you're qualified, (laughs) I'm not. Um, But I think that it's important to talk about your own personal experience because it'll make you feel not alone and I think that that's what I found with my miscarriage my endo even you know having this whole celiac debacle that's going on in my life right now I'm got the celiac gene I've got to come from a family of celiacs but I just haven't gone through the celiac testing but I've got you know we speak about this all the time (laughs) I get glutened and I get really sick so you know but there's just so many I'm on Facebook groups for celiacs you know Mm. there's just so many groups of people out there that unfortunately are going through the same thing and um you just need to find your people to really help you and friends and family might not be the people no yeah and that's my experience as well is like particularly I think for me growing up I was not somebody who was very good at sharing information I was very sort of to myself as a child and so and this is where I think that therapy was really beneficial for me is because having that external party, like you said before, that's not your family, it's not your friends that you can actually share information with is just such like, it's just such a valuable tool to be able to have and to get like an unbiased opinion on your life (laughs) and how you're processing things. Then it's, yeah. And that's why it's so important to find somebody who actually resonates with you is because you're potentially going to share more with this stranger than you have with anyone in your entire life. So you need to be able to trust this person. You need to be able to feel, albeit you probably won't, you know, at the first session feel comfortable enough to share your entire life with them, but you need to know that you feel safe with them. And if you don't feel safe and safe, I don't mean just physically safe, like you feel mentally safe. Um, I think that's probably the biggest tell. Like if you don't feel like you can, yeah, mentally feel safe to share that information with them, then yeah, finding somebody else is, is such a valuable experience to go through. Yeah. It's a painful experience. Yeah. It's look, I actually really love my you know, going to therapy. Um, She's taught me this amazing thing about having a safe. And so for me, one thing that I really find beneficial is if I'm working and I get an email or something triggers me or I get stressed, I literally put it in this mental safe and I unpack it with her at the next session rather than, or, you know, once I've done a meditation or once I feel calm, I actually unpack it with myself and that really allows me to sort of get on with my day. I never let it overflow. Mm. Um, Do you write it down or anything so that you sort of... No, I remember it. Yeah. Yeah. I find if I write things down, then I really negatively sort of... I find if I write it down, then mentally I worry about it more. Yeah. If that makes sense. I used to journal all the time. I haven't... (laughs) lately things work for some people things don't for others yeah I used to do word vomit um which Mm. is a really lovely way way of saying I used to wake up in the morning and I used to just write whatever was in my mind yeah um but for me my Vedic meditation has really overturned overtaken that it's heaven I've got the most amazing person she's in Bondi she's the most incredible human in the world um And for me, I was really struggling with, you know, going through my fertility issues and, you know, Mm -hmm. going to therapy was great. But even my therapist, she's like, you're in this fight or flight mode and you're constantly getting triggered. You're constantly on edge. You don't feel safe. And how are you going to create a baby? And how are you going to be able? So one big thing for me is I've got this fear of passing on trauma. And so for my mom, my mom um, went through incredible amount of trauma as a child. Mm -hmm. um there's a similar connotation to what I've been through and so for me I had this fear about passing it on and so it's called epigenetics yeah yeah and um I started researching more about it so I really had to make this decision for me to be able to try and do the work before Mm -hmm. I created a human 
And so I started last year and instantly I just felt this shift in the way that I perceived myself, my energy levels and just really creating this safe space for me on top of my therapy Mm. to be able to do the work. And it was just a really um, beautiful moment because I used to really struggle with guided meditation. I mean, I always used to force myself into meditation and I just would never be able to get into it. But I think that's where like the whole fight or flight thing plays in is when you're in that fight or flight, it's really challenging to actually bring yourself into a meditative state from that. Um, yeah. So you kind of do need to find what works and also potentially process trauma before you can because trauma keeps you in that fight or flight state. So, yeah. um, and, and again, trauma is not necessarily just for people listening. It's not necessarily just your big traumas like sexual assault and, you know, those sorts of things. It's yeah. It can be quite sort of small things that have occurred over your lifetime um, yeah. that, you know, are simply things like not feeling seen or heard growing up. Like it's it's not necessarily the big T's that we often hear about but these things can keep you in that fight or flight state. Um, So yeah, it's really interesting to hear your experience with that. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because um, I almost have two sets of PTSD. So I've got PTSD from my sexual assault and then I've got PTSD from being misdiagnosed for my ectopic pregnancy. And Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was a month of me going up to hospitals and they're like, there's nothing wrong with you. It's all mental. You've just had a miscarriage. And then I actually ended up getting rushed up with, bleeding internally and essentially having life life saving um, therapy uh life saving surgery oh and so for me i had to process both of these traumas but then it's so funny because even this trying to conceive stage that we went into and endometriosis that i went through after all really traumatic experiences all and traumas. and you know even being in an there's just, you've got these big T's, which is obviously what we're talking about, you know, nearly dying and, you know, having sexual assault and all of this or the loss of someone. But you've got all of these little T's that build up and they can be just as impactful. So if it doesn't resonate with you having a big T trauma, you might have these little T traumas and mm. it can really build up. You know, imagine exactly what I'm talking about, you know, all of these cars on the highway yeah. and all of these cars being literally little T's and it's just getting banked up and Mm. you can't actually process your trauma so I don't know I'm such a big advocate for speaking about this um which I love so much about you and why I feel like I again know you so well through your social media is because you are so authentic and real with what you do there and I think you've created such a safe space for so many people there so thank you for doing that do you ever get any like negative um, I was just about yeah. Negative, yeah, negative negative feedback, feedback or negative or day. Like criticism or um from from sharing no that's good i've been extremely fortunate um to only get a really beautiful community online mm. um i'm sure people are like oh god we get it you're pregnant okay cool let's talk about <laughs> something else I totally know that that's, you know, I'm living and breathing, you know, having a bump and, you know, it's something so exciting for me. But like, but, um, also, it's your space to do whatever you want with and that's what's going on for you and you get to share that as much as you like. And I know, but then that's that whole self-critical thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure no one's even thinking that, but it's no. just me like, going, oh, I'm just talking about it too much. Um, but no, I've been really fortunate, but I think it's just because, I talk about stuff that happens all the time in people's lives and, you know, I put on weight during my endo and my fertility and I speak about that and I just, I think it's so important because social media can be so damaging and I'm so fearful of the next generation that's growing up on TikTok because I just fear that there's such an image out there that people think that they need to fit and. I would hate to be going through school right now as those oh, teenagers. Absolutely. absolutely. And, again, um, why I love you so much for, you know, the positive message that you are putting out there. You're so real with everything that you do. Um, and I think that it is just such, like, it's such an inspiring thing to see on social media because we don't see enough of it. And I'm so glad that you are getting so much positive feedback for that because yeah. you should be. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, like, I have some really shit days. Like, I have days where I don't want to get out of bed. I just want to sit on a lounge, eat my white chocolate lint bunny which you told me is gluten-free so I'm so happy (laughs) um you know and I have big cries Mm. but I think it's so important to have those bad days 
um, incorporate it into your life because it really allows you to process whatever's going through your brain. Yeah, exactly. And I think that also I've what I've worked out is that from me now being able to go from a place where I was having probably a lot more bad, definitely a lot more bad days than good days, the things that I've now sort of started to work out is that I can appreciate the good days so much more, but also now having gone through therapy and everything like that, it's so much easier for me to call myself out when things start to slide. So, and like the last month for me has been a really stressful one. And, you know, I'm sort of like pulling at things and going, okay, like I'm sliding, I'm sliding and yeah. trying to now put things in place to sort of prevent going back into places that I don't want to go back into. And so I think that, again, like we're saying, like everything happens for a reason and it's just learning the lessons that you can from what's happened in the past and learning what you can do to protect yourself in the future as well. So getting to be able to appreciate those good days so much more because you've had bad days um, is one of the things that I always sort of look to and sort of when I find those moments of calm in my days because, again, I resonate so much with the sort of fight or flight in the brain, the traffic jam in the brain. (laughs) That's just my brain a lot of the time. All the time, yeah. Um, And it wasn't – I found a good therapist would have been – Around the time, oh, it would have been just before COVID last year. So it would have been, yeah, February last year. I found, I, I've been, I reckon 10 before that, that I just sort of hit and miss. Um, like got something from them, but not, didn't really hit what I needed to hit. Um, and I found that through the coming like sort of months after that, that I would start to get these like glimmers of like calm. And it was something that I had never experienced in my life before to have these like moments of stillness in my brain. And it was just phenomenal. So I think that now it's sort of, it's almost given me like a goalpost to sort of go, you know what, like I'm not going to be there every day. I might only be there once a month, but like I know that there's stillness there somewhere. And when I get too busy, that that's the sort of thing that I come back to. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, life is stressful. Absolutely. I think it's <laughs> <laughs> like enough said and podcast um, <laughs> I think even if you don't think that you have trauma or little trauma or anything we are constantly engaged with emails popping up our phones going off you know constantly stimulated by mm. technology and constantly stimulated by news and floods and fires and coronavirus and it's just very stressful to be alive right now so I think that finding what works for you is so important yeah absolutely and yeah be that meditation be that journaling be that therapy be that exercise as long as it's a healthy way for you to sort of process what you're doing on that note like what are the things that you have really so therapy is obviously one of the ones in the meditation we've spoken about is there anything else that you found really beneficial on your mental health journey I do a thing called a micro moment Mm-hmm. Sure. and so for me I have to live by structure so I literally have scheduled in my calendar at 10 a.m and 2 p.m the word micro moment and like a little yellow love heart and basically what it is is I take a deep breath in I look outside or I look at something to focus on and I just take a few deep breaths and just really focus on what I'm looking at so for me I look at leaves because I've got a tree right out the front Mm. or I've got a crystal in front of me or I've got a pen and I just really try and take some deep breaths and try and center myself by focusing on what's in front of me and I find that this really helps to bring my nervous system down and to actually regulate myself and so I find that that really helps I do box breathing mm. which is box breathing. box breathing has really helped me um, I used to get extremely anxious and nearly have panic attacks in certain places being outside. And so for me, I, you know, have tried to implement these really quick little things like box breathing to help, you know, calm my nervous system down. And box breathing was what my psychologist has taught me. Um, Going for walks with my dogs. Mm. Have your animals been a source of sort of connection for you as well? Yeah, massively. I think Hercules, who's our oldest sausage dog, um, he we got him just as I was going through that self-sabotage and that massive spout of depression. And I remember I would be crying on the bathroom floor for hours in hysterics and he would literally sit as a puppy 
in my lap like with me and I honestly think honestly it brings back I get so upset just thinking about how sad I was um he without him I wouldn't have been able to get through anything Mm. so and obviously Hector's now come along and Mm. you know they're little best friends and they just make you so happy animals just make you so happy (laughs) you get home from a shit day yeah and they're just there wagging their tails so excited so there's definitely something to be said for therapy dogs oh so the therapist that I see she's got Max her therapy dog and he is the best (laughs) although he's a bit naughty he failed his therapy dog (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but um yeah I think that just finding things that create a bit of bliss and so for me I love staying at home my partner loves going out with his mates um loves going to restaurants whereas for me perfect night in would be like good food big bowl of pasta <laughs> on the couch watching Netflix like I yeah, love like being alone oh I just love being at home it's just so me so COVID for me I was like this yeah. is heaven thank um, god <laughs> yeah um and I was going through my massive endo at the time so yeah. that was you know one benefit I guess um yeah I just think that finding things I think eating healthy food really lights me up and yeah. I really thrive when I can eat healthy food I think that's what I struggled with in my first trimester slash first 17 18 weeks pregnancy is because I wasn't eating my normal foods. Um, Obviously, I was eating to survive and, you know, um, carbs and Do what you choose in the first trimester. Yeah, Macca's fries all the time. Um, But, yeah, I'm really enjoying being back and eating my healthy food and just being outside really helps me. But I think just keeping systemized and keeping organized really helps, helps me. Amazing. And I wanted to ask before we finish up, um, you've obviously got your amazing food business and your yes. beauty bites, which are so bloody delicious. I am so obsessed with them. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask with your, you've obviously got a lot going on in terms of business. So you've got three businesses and I think you've potentially got more on the way. Is that right? Yeah, so we've got Beauty Bites, which are in at Coles and Priceline, yeah. which are, you know, the collagen and, pro- and vit- uh, yeah, vitamins and fibres. Oh, yeah, gluten-free. It's non-negotiable. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've got that business and it's just been so well received. We're about to start mm. exporting overseas, which is really exciting. I've got a skincare and nutraceutical brand um, launching in a few weeks. How exciting because just a few months, is really, realistically. Going, so I think we all need to <laughs> take some tips from you. I certainly do. <laughs> oh, look, you know, hormonal breakouts are really, it's just life, really. Um, although we are doing some products that we really target hormonal breakouts. So I'll keep you posted. And then we've got my online content creation business and then we will be launching another business once bubs is due um and born which is all around so high achiever all around yeah it's like I don't know I'm very much I have a life a life event or a life issue so for me with the beauty bites I couldn't find anything that was really low on sugar that tasted delicious um I was taking collagen powders, I was taking my probiotics, my prebiotics and my vitamins and then buying snacks. And so I really wanted to create that all in one product. And then um the skincare is a natural clean beauty brand. And so for me I couldn't find anything that was comparative to my nutri- uh, my cosmeceutical products which were, you know, high potents and different molecular weights. And so I got the shits and I was like, "Well, I'm going to create a brand." <laughs> yes, you do. Um As you do. So, yeah, really busy. I thrive off being busy. Mm. I also love my downtime and I think that that's something that I am really learning to do, especially I was pretty much out of action for three months. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I felt guilty for so long. I was like, oh, I could be doing all this work, but I really had to surrender. So, yeah, I, I just love business. I love helping people and you know, I find it fascinating creating products. It's really cool. It's amazing. And again, I think that you've got such an authentic story to tell behind all of that um, based on your story, but also as well, like your reason for creating those is the genuine need because you find, like you found a gap in the market that's just not suiting what you wanted and being able to fulfill it. And again, the beauty bites, I am addicted to them. I don't know how you make them (laughs) taste so good, but have like no sugar in them. Um, They are so good. Uh, so you can find them at Priceline and you can buy them online and in Coles as well, I believe, Sarah. That's it. Yep. Yeah. And we've got a few more retailers launching at the end of the year, but nothing's confirmed yet. Um, yeah. 
So the real question is, how do you do all of this and still manage work-life balance? That is my real question. <laughs> I don't. I don't have work-life balance. Like, <laughs> going to be completely real, um, I never see my friends. My friends like have to send me harassment text messages. I got a message yesterday. You're not being the only like, one that gets them. <laughs> oh yeah. My friend's like, do you just not even check your phone, but you're always on your phone? I'm like, I've got 500 unread SMSs at the moment. I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah, do not look at my, um, I've got about 6,000 unread emails. (laughs) See, I I read them, but then don't respond. (laughs) Oh, no, I just, uh, I've got my read receipts on. So my friends get Uh, even angrier when I've got my read receipts on. Read it. No, I like my read receipts on. (laughs) Don't know why. (laughs) Um. Look, it's something that I definitely am working on and that's obviously something having bubs in July, my partner and I will be working on. Um, he's full-time in the businesses too. So Amazing. we really want to create a little bit more work-life balance, yeah. but we, I don't know, we love it and it is our lives and, you know, obviously we can all, we can do better. But Well, I think the thing is that it's different for everyone. Like what that work-life balance looks like is different for everyone and that, you know, I think that we put people up on a pedestal who do really like love their work and they actually thrive on having a more work to life balance. Um, but that doesn't mean that's the gold standard or the way that you should go or anything like that. So I think that it's really important to just acknowledge that that's what works for you in this season of your life. Like that might change in the next season of your life. 100%. And that's what I keep on thinking. You know, I'm doing the hard work now. We're now in a fortunate position where we're hiring more people, more full time people. Um, so now I think that I'm gradually being able to gradually move away and do the things that really light me up. Like I don't love doing my accounting. So now we've hired a CFO. So, (laughs) you know, it's just about trying to find these little implementations to make life easier. Mm. Um, you know, so I can go to the movies on Tuesday night and not feel guilty. So, you know, it's definitely something that I'm working towards but not working actively on at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this podcast. I am so Thanks grateful for, for sharing every for you sharing everything that you did with us today. Um, last thing is, is there anything that you wish to share with anyone who is listening to this, who is resonating with your story? Is there anything that you would like to share with them or any advice that you'd like to give to them? My only piece of advice, and this is what I always say, is to just trust your gut. For me, in everything, I even tell my staff, you know, if they're making a decision, I'm like, what does your gut say? Trust your gut, go with your gut. And it took me a long time to trust what I was actually thinking. And the moment that I did was completely life-changing. So if something doesn't feel right, if something feels right, go with it because I guarantee you, more often than not, it, it's the right decision. Absolutely. I think that's one of the things that I've learned the most over the last few years as well as trusting your gut, even in like business decisions and more so in business decisions as well. Um, but yeah, like listening to your body. And one thing that I, I've actually sort of started doing over the last probably six months is this little statement that I say, and it's high body, what do you need? And it's just the first thing that comes to my mind. I sort of like think about that and go, okay, I need to do that. And so if I'm feeling overwhelmed or like stressed out or whatever it is, it's just high body. What do you need? And there's literally every single time there's something that comes to my mind, like straight up. I don't even have to think about it. Like it's like rest, sleep. I was just about to say mine would definitely be sleep more. You need to nap. (laughs) Um, And that's me just listening to my gut. That's how I've sort of been able to tune into what it is. Or like even with business decisions, like what do you think about that person? And just sort of like first thing that comes to my mind, like I need to trust that. So yeah, yeah, love that piece of advice. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I am sure we will get you back on to talk about so many more elements of your life because I just love your story so much. And I think you have so much wisdom to share. Um, but we are very grateful to have you on today. So thank you very much. You're so very welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode with Kira Rumble. I hope that those of you who have gone through struggles with fertility and pregnancy loss and miscarriage know that you are not alone in this journey. It is something that is just so incredibly common, yet so often swept under the rug. So I think that it's really important that we're bringing this conversation to light, even though it is a really challenging uh, conversation. If you enjoyed this episode uh, and you think that some of your friends would, we would love it if you shared a screenshot of this episode on your 
Instagram stories and make sure that you tag me at Marika Day. Um, You can also support this podcast and support me by leaving a rating and review on your favorite podcasting platform uh, and make sure you subscribe on your podcasting platform as well so that you don't miss an episode. Now, we also do have a Facebook community. So if you want to jump in and continue the conversation online, make sure that you find us on Facebook. We are off the record with Marika Day. So just search that in your Facebook profile um, and we'll come up. Look forward to chatting with you guys next week. 